Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm here today to talk about a little bit of a project that um, I'm working on with my colleague Kim Gertz. Uh, Kim can't be here today, she's on her way down to Antarctica, which is aiming to uh, define marine habitat use by seabirds. And so I'll, I'll just kick off with a little bit of um, a little bit of context, and some of this is a bit, a bit cliched now, but it's um, one of those cliches is that New Zealand is the seabird capital of the world. There are more species and subspecies of seabirds here than anywhere else on Earth. The current tally is about 168 species or subspecies recorded throughout the EZ, and of that total, about 99 actually breed here, which knocks any other nation's total into a cocked hat. And a lot of those 99, about half are endemic, which means they breed nowhere else. So New Zealand enjoys this really, really high, off-the-scale diversity of seabirds. And not only do we enjoy this high diversity, New Zealand also supports really vast populations of seabirds, which again dwarf other nation states' populations. So as an example, again, a little bit of a cliche. On the left there, a map of the UK, New Zealand on the right, and you'll notice that the land areas for both those nations are roughly the same. The UK currently supports about six or seven million seabirds in total. Um, the Snares Islands, which are in that little yellow circle, barely registering at this scale of the map, a little speck in the ocean, support more seabirds than the UK. So if you imagine the little speck in the ocean down there, south of Stewart Island, supporting the same number of seabirds as the UK, you can see very quickly when you add in all the other seabird colonies that we have a vast seabird assemblage here in New Zealand, very diverse. Um, and so why are we interested in habitat use by seabirds? Well, I guess really we're addressing this question really with another question, which is, what is what's the potential impact on seabirds of a proposed activity at a particular location? And this is the sort of question that we've encountered more recently from environment court hearings or EPA hearings, where applicants are wanting to or proposing to undertake some activity in the marine estate and as part of that process they need to convince decision makers or policy makers that what they're proposing to do isn't going to have any effect on seabirds which with one or two exceptions are all protected by law. So in order to answer that question the very first step is the requirement for some knowledge about where seabirds go and how their patterns of distribution within New Zealand change over time. And only when you have that piece of information can you then start to address the risk or assess the impacts of potential activities. Now you normally find that sort of information out from a vessel. You basically poodle around the ocean in a structured way and you count and observe seabirds, you identify the species, you um, record what they're doing. Um, that has been done at the scale of the EZ, not in New Zealand, it's been done in the UK. Uh, as a result of the development of the North Sea oil industry, it became apparent that knowing where seabirds go and how that pattern changes over time was important to be able to mitigate any effects of the North Sea oil industry, so it has been done. In New Zealand, of course, with a very large EZ, doing that at that sort of scale on a vessel would be staggeringly expensive, many, many millions of dollars, um, and it would take a long time. So the pro project that I'm involved with is really trying to look at whether there are other methods to maximise the use of resources to be able to get at those answers to those sort of questions about where seabirds go and how that distribution changes over time. And we're using um, sort of a tiered modelling approach to address this. The first approach is going to be a very relative environmental suitability model. And then we have two habitat suitability models, one using sightings data, the second using electronic tag data. Now, the RES model requires only published information, what we currently know about seabird distributions, the sort of environmental drivers that dictate where they go. Do they forage over deep water, shallow water, warm water, cold water? And it doesn't actually include, those sort of models don't actually include any, any location data. We're using sightings data from a, a, a global um, depository of uh, sightings information called eBird. So that's publicly available information about where birds go or where they've been sighted. And finally, we're going to use some electronic tag data. So these are data that we've collected by deploying various electronic gizmos on birds, which record where they go in great detail. We're using five species as study species. And essentially what we're going to do is construct those models 
and then compare the veracity of whether the very simple model, the RES model, can actually tell you where CBOs go to the same extent with the same level of information as a more complex model based on sightings data or tracking data. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Very much up. <laughs>